So if you guys haven't heard the latest from Kanakistan, in Toronto, a wealthy businessman will have to pay more than $50,000 a month in spousal support for the next 10 years to a woman which with he had a long-term relationship, even though they kept separate homes and had no kids together. The Ontario top court has ruled. They talk a little bit about the idea of common law marriage, and then some clickbait articles. Now the question is, how do I know about this? Well... Well, our local intellectual dark web slash very rational anti-feminist type author slash content creator Janice Fiamengo sent out this tweet. For anybody wondering why men are swearing off women, the reason may be found in a ruling by Ontario's highest court, which a man will be forced to lavishly support a woman he never married, never lived with, and never had children with. And I'm not going to lie to you, this one irritates me. I have to decide by the end of this if Janice is either being ignorant or willfully misleading. So let's see, what am I talking about here? I went and looked at the article. The article didn't say much more. And typical of me, I've spent enough time on Reddit to know that most people don't read past the headlines. So I decided to do a deep dive. What did I do? I actually went in and took a look. So we'll take a look at the court case. Right now, I got a citation for Clemens versus Latner from the Superior Court of Justice. If you see the argument, the applicant, Lisa Clemens, seeks spousal support from the respondent, Michael Latner, under Part 3 of the Family Law Act. The primary issue is where the applicant is a spouse for the purposes of the act. If she is not a spouse, the case ends here. If she's a spouse, then the issue of spousal support needs to be determined. So they give you a little bit of background. Clemens, she's a 55-year-old woman. She was 51 years old when the party separated. She had two children from a previous marriage, 28 and 25. The children lived with her following the separation and divorce from David Clemens. When Mr. Latner and Ms. Clemens met, Ms. Clemens was 38, Matt was 11, and Lindsay was 8. They go to some of her history here, and honestly, if you read into this, you're going to see she's a bit of a thought. Ms. Clemens started a degree in university, but never finished. She worked as a model. When they met, she was working at with her brother in sales and marketing in the construction business, earning about five grand a month. She was also getting about 850 a month of child support. And at some point, the incre payments increased to 2,000 per month. It ended in the spring of 2018, given the children finished school and were working. Hey, isn't that the same year that they separated? With a second bow here? Fair enough. So following the end of the relationship, she trained and qualified as a yoga instructor, earning about a grand a month. She teaches two to three classes a day, four to five a week, earning 50 bucks an hour. So yeah, <laughs> model slash thought slash yoga instructor slash... <laughs> Anyways, Latner's 63. He's got two kids too. They're in their 30s. He has a law degree, doesn't practice law. Whole bunch of like fancy business stuff here. There is no dispute that Mr. Latner was a man of significant means and wealth when the parties and continued to be so to date. So Aaron, the youngest, works for companies, three siblings. So we're going to skip past a lot of this. This is mostly going to be background story, and I really suggest you guys give it a read. So it's Ms. Clemens' position that the parties were spouses and treated by a wife. She received an engagement ring, a wedding band, eternity band, they celebrated anniversaries. He sent her letters and cards professing his love and commitment whole bunch of other stuff in here now we go to his position and his position was that she was just a travel buddy and a plate nothing more he acknowledges they were romantic but they never lived together and were not spouses separate bank accounts even though he gave her a credit card for convenience but she didn't have carte blanche to spend which you gave somebody a credit card they have carte blanche to spend Um, her children were her priority, and his children were his priority. They signed a domestic contract, which never ended up getting signed. And his evidence is that he would never marry or move in with her without one. So this is the part that I think is going to matter, and this is the part that uh, Janice here forgot to mention in that little outrage bait tweet. I find that uh, Ms. Clemens was prone to exaggeration at times when giving her testimony, by way of example... When she may have been involved in renovations in a condo, she exaggerated her level of involvement in the same. I do not accept her evidence that she helped find the property, that her uh, brother, father, and sister were all in the same building. 
I accept Steven's testimony that he became aware of the property being listed in the same building and alerted his brother. I also find that she exaggerated the time they spent in Florida. They did not reside there from October until April, as she initially claimed. Despite such problems with their testimony, I found her to be responsive to the questions and direct with her answers. Her answers were more or less consistent and consistent with other evidence. Her testimony was not without fault, but in most instances where there is conflict between the testimony of the parties, I accept Ms. Clemens' evidence over Mr. Latner's evidence for the reasons I've set out below. This is the important part. So I find there were more problems with the evidence given by Mr. Latner during his testimony and cross-examination. His position on various facts changed during the trial. I found Mr. Latner to be deliberately evasive when answering questions in cross-examination and unwilling to answer appropriate questions. When challenged on a point, his answers were not consistent, often ultimately deferring the question to others, such as Mr. Bester, when not willing to answer questions. I did not find Mr. Latner to be a credible witness, and therefore I have to find his evidence unreliable in many circumstances throughout the trial. By way of example, when shown a picture of him and Miss Clemens in Costa Rica with the words, Will you marry me, written in the sand, along with their names, joined by a heart, he first denied proposing to Miss Clemens, suggesting that the people sitting next to them wrote the message in the sand, not him. Then he said that he could not recall. Then he said that if he did, he was not sure what the point was. And that's the key point that you're going to see here. Especially later on, so in section 24. Mr. Latner was equally evasive when answering questions about the structural reorganization of the family companies in 2017 as a result of winding up on a trust. He received $70 million from the winding up, a further $21 million held throughout the interest in a different company, the remaining money went from the trust to a new trust for his children. The trust was settled for $150 million held by a holding company and $11.8 million in another company. His initial testimony was that he did not have any formal discussions on the payout of capital from the trust. He later acknowledged that he had his ultimate say in how the money was distributed from the trust, and although he was a trustee, the evidence was he did not know who the trustees of the trust were. There were three original trustees, and yada yada yada. The point is, the man has a lot of money, and he did the biggest no-no you can do in any kind of civil or criminal case. You lie, or you obfuscate the truth to the judge. They could sniff right through that stuff. So my question is, why did Janice portray this as the downtrodden man and the uh, horrible, horrible, evil Machiavellian woman? I mean, she's a professor of English in the University of Ottawa, so reading and writing is kind of her thing. I mean, the legal briefing wasn't particularly long, it wasn't hard to find, it wasn't a very legal jargony piece to read. So the question is then, did she know about the details of this case and not care? Or did she not even bother to look them up? Let me know in the comments, by the way. I'm kind of curious. So, it's either she didn't bother, and if she did, she still knew the difference that her audience would react to. And this is the point here that I'm getting at. From a media perspective, this is actually a very clever piece, because she plays it up as the downtrodden man and the evil vindictive women, and a certain audience of people, I call them PowerPoint MGTOWs, eat this stuff up like you wouldn't believe. It's a justification of a lonely, sadder existence where all women are bad and all guys are downtrodden and powerful and millionaires, but powerless at the same time, you know? Meanwhile, that's not the case at all. This is a guy who sabotaged himself at every, every single turn and every chance he had. And then at the same time, he ends it off by lying to the judge, gets caught, gets slapped for it. But again, from a media perspective, this is an easy sell. Remove all the particular details, remove all the legal findings, removing any type of context or nuance or anything we can learn from it, and just play it up. Evil woman, man victim. Outstanding. Like, share, subscribe. It builds her clout, it builds her credibility among a certain audience, and it's all built on a house of lies. Which kind of makes sense, by the way, because if you think about it, a lot of guys accuse people like me or Rolo Tomasi of being a cult. But I mean... Cults are kind of built on these kind of like lying stories here, so it makes sense. If that's the only thing you know, you would assume everybody else has it too. Anyways. This is the part of the video where I give you some actionable advice. If you don't want to marry a girl, 
don't buy her a ring. If you don't want to marry a girl, don't call her your wife. Oh yeah, that's something else that's in the court filings too. He actually referred to her as Mrs. Latner or his wife all the time socially. Um, if you don't want to marry a girl, don't take her on vacations with you for three, four months at a time. If you don't want to marry a girl, don't write, I want to marry you in the sand, take a picture and leave it on the nightstand. Basically, and I can't believe I have to say this one. If you learn nothing else from this video, learn this. Do not lie or be evasive to the courts. There is nothing that a judge will hate more than being lied to by people he's trying to judiciously check for. Judges hate that crap and they're going to use it against you. Even if your case is 100% right and you have all the facts and all the on all the stuff in your corner, if you start lying to the courts, they're going to treat all of your evidence and all of your testimony as suspect. So that's really going to shoot you in the foot. Anyways, the time to not be divorce raped by this woman was long before this last 15 years. So the takeaways from this video, there's three bad things you can do. The worst thing you can do is consume media that's meant to pander to you. The second worst thing you can do is advertise for media that panders to you and shout it from the rooftops. The third worst thing you can do is not like or subscribe to this video and this channel and see more content like this all the time. I'm actually curious about your thoughts in the comments. Do you think Janice was being manipulative or do you think she was just being naive and lazy? Let me know in the comments and I'll talk to you on the next one. Cheers.